Today is going to be the uh, last subtopic within the exact recovery part of the class. I got kind of obsessed with this topic this year, so for better or for worse, I'll give you a lot of lectures on it. Um, so today I want to introduce the idea of LP decoding, uh, and this will spill out over a little bit into the beginning of Wednesday, and then we'll start a new topic uh, on Wednesday. So this is um, <coughs> motivated by a topic hopefully some of you have seen at least a little bit of, although I'm not going to assume any background, uh, namely error correcting codes. So error correcting codes is when you want to encode information in a way that it's resilient to errors, things like bit flips, okay? And uh, so we're only going to be talking about binary codes today, so it's just going to be things uh, over the alphabet 0, 1. And um, a couple things that you should remember, so first of all the Hamming distance between two vectors, that's just the number of coordinates in which they differ. And then the distance of a code, which is an important parameter, uh, is the minimum distance between, the minimum Hamming distance between any two code words, okay? So formally a code is just a subset of binary n vectors, okay, so it's just a subset of 0, 1 to the n, and one of the parameters you care about is amongst all vectors in your code in this subset, what's the minimum Hamming distance between any two, okay? So for example, uh, so here's a code. You could just think about all the binary n vectors that have even parity, meaning the number of ones is even. Okay? So what would, be the, what would be the distance of this code? Yeah. It's two. It would be two, right? So if you flip one bit, then it's not a code word, because all of a sudden you have an odd number of ones, right? But if you flip two bits, you can get back to a code word again. Okay? So code words need to differ by two bits, two coordinates, but indeed some code words do differ only by two coordinates, okay? And you know, one way to think about this is you, know, you could take just all 0, 1 vectors of length n to the minus 1 and then append a parity bit, okay? So just whatever the parity is of the first n minus 1, you stick that at the end to make it even overall. That's one way of thinking about this code, okay? So this is a code that has a lot of words in pretty small distance and a lot of the codes that people think about and what we're gonna be thinking about today are codes where the distance is much bigger between two different code words. In particular, we not to not just detect an error, okay? So if you have distance two, that means if in transmission exactly one bit got flipped, you'll know something went wrong, okay? Because you'll see an odd number of ones, and you're like, you basically say, hey, sender, retransmit. I don't know what you said, okay? But if you think about it, what about the distance is like a lot bigger than two, okay? What if it's just D in general? Well then, certainly, even if there's as many as D minus one errors, and again, adversarial, okay, not probabilistic, just adversarial errors, if there's D minus one or less, you'll certainly notice, because what you get won't be a code word by the definition of distance. On the other hand, if less than D over two bits were flipped, then, actually, without asking for a retransmission, you can reconstruct what the sender meant, because you just look at what is the nearest thing which actually is a code word. Okay, so you just say, you know, how many, how many coordinates do I have to flip to get back to a code word? You know, let's just flip them, that must be what they meant. Okay, so by the triangle inequality, if everything is D apart, and you get something, and there's the most D over two errors, it's closer to the original code word than any of the others. Okay? So distance D allows you to detect D minus one errors, and it allows you to correct less than D over two errors. And so the point of this lecture is to study the computational problem of given a corrupted code word, efficiently reconstruct, you know, what is the nearest code word to it, okay? And uh, to continue the theme of, of some of the recent lectures, we're gonna be asking when can you do this via linear programming, okay? And again, there's going to be a actually quite nice sort of non-trivial linear relaxation of this problem, and we'll again be seeking conditions under which this linear program uh, is exact, all right? Okay. So this idea of decoding via linear programming works nicely uh, for a family of codes, which is what I want to introduce next. And this already, you know, I mean, one of the fun things about this topic is you'll see some ideas which if you haven't seen them before, they're just cool ideas, okay? So idea number one is, is there's a very nice way to use graphs to naturally induce codes. Okay? So I want to tell you about that next. So this is, a, I mean, this is sort of a very old idea. Um, I mean, over 50 years due to Gallagher, and then the gra these graphs are often called Tanner graphs uh, for work in the 80s. 
really, it sort of took off big time, at least in the computer science world, with a paper of Sipser and Spielman about 20 years ago. And then there's been a lot of work on uh, you know, these connections between graphs and codes in the last couple decades. So here's the, here's the idea. Okay. So we're going to have a bipartite graph. And these bipartite graphs are going to play an important role uh, in our discussion of this topic. The left-hand side are the variables. Okay? So there's n of them. Okay? So these are just like the coordinates. And then on the right-hand side, we're going to have a bunch of parity checks. Okay? And there'll be edges in this bipartite graph. <coughs> And uh, so for a given binary vector of length n, so if you like a assignment of 0 or 1 to each of these vertices, we'll say that such an x satisfies the jth check if when we zoom in on just the coordinates of x, okay, so j, remember, j is going to be one of these vertices. So there's like a canonical j. And so a parity check, a node on this side, is going to have neighbors on the other side. It's a bipartite graph. Okay, so there's some subset of variables that neighbor this check j. N of j is, denotes the neighbors of a vertex. So this is saying for the jth check, the jth parity check, which variables are connected to it, involved in it, project this n vector to that subset of coordinates. And then this constraint insists that there's an even number of ones amongst these coordinates. Okay. So if J has five neighbors, then we're saying a necessary, well, sort of, for this particular parity check to be happy, to be satisfied, zero, two, or four of those five neighbors should be set to one. Okay? Not one, not three, not five. All right? So that's how you satisfy just one of the parity checks. And then the code words are exactly the vectors which satisfy every single one of the parity checks. Okay. Yes, everything's going to be of the code. everything's going to be binary. Yep, exactly. So at the end of the day, you should think of each of these as you know an X is basically a zero one labeling of these vertices. Right? So that's sort of what X looks like, and then X projected onto N of J. That's just you know some five coordinates. Okay, some five components. So that's going to be like a five bit vector. Okay. So this is basically establishing. Uh, evenness of parity of various subsets of the left-hand side. Okay, that's what's going on. So, like, what about this set? Could you imagine a bipartite graph which corresponds to this code here? Yeah. The one vertex on the right, that's connected to everything on the left. That's exactly right. Okay, so this corresponds to having a single constraint. Which variables are involved? All of them. Okay, so it's one node on the right, and it's like a star to the left-hand side. In general, throughout this lecture, I want you to think of these graphs as being sparse. Okay? So think, for example, that uh, maybe each parity check involves like a random subset of 20 variables, ballpark. And maybe each of the variables is involved in like 10 different parity checks. Okay? So think of it as a sparse bipartite graph. All right? That's what you should have in mind. So in particular, we're going to have lots of parity checks, and they will be overlapping in their variables. Okay? So this one may have 10 variables, and maybe two of those variables are also in some other parity check. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So the goal then, okay, so just, I mean, literally, any bipartite graph, okay, without any further assumptions, induces a code. Okay? So this defines a code. Right? It's exactly the subset which satisfies these parity checks. But now, you know, to have a good code in, you know, your favorite definition of good, presumably, you know, we need to, it's going to be a subset of all possible graphs. 
So let's think about what kind of graphs would lead to codes that are good in some sense. And so the focus in the lectures is to be sufficient conditions on the graph G so that, well, first of all, it should be that we can correct many errors, i.e. the minimum distance between any two code words should be big. And here by big, I mean, you know, a constant fraction of n. Okay? So let's say at least 1% of n, or something like this. Okay? So even if, you know, 1 out of 20 of your bits are getting flipped, okay, for this very long message, you can still, uh, there's, you know, then it's still, uh, you're still closer to the original code word than to any other code word. Okay? So you really need a ton of corruptions to actually push something to get confused with some other code word. So that's the first thing, but then uh, we also want to actually do the correction, so the decoding, efficiently. Okay? So that's what we mean by good. Okay? All right, so here are the conditions we're going to be looking at. And these conditions, you know, basically correspond to what people call uh, low density parity check codes. Okay, so LDPC. Okay, so if you do a search on that, you'll find lots and lots and lots of papers. Uh, the parity check, you know, it's kind of obvious what that comes from, right? The constraints are all these parity checks. The low density refers to the fact that the graph is sparse. Okay, so bounded degrees. All right. All right. So LDPC codes. So the version we're going to look at is I'm going to assume that the left hand side is regular. So D regular. So in other words, every variable participates in exactly the same number D of parity check constraints. Again, think of D as 10, certainly O of 1. Okay? Similarly, the right-hand side, we want to have constant degree. It may or may not be regular, it doesn't really matter. But degree O of 1. Again, think of it as maybe like 20. Okay, so think of maybe the right-hand side as being half the size as the left-hand side and having double the degree. And then, uh, the important thing is we want an expansion condition. Okay, so if you haven't seen expanders before, this is another very nice concept that uh, this lecture will introduce you to. So the third condition we want is the following. And for some constant delta independent of n, so that for all not too crazy large subsets of S, so let's say, you know, 1% of the nodes or something like that. So for all subsets of the nodes, but as large as linear in N, okay, so remember delta is a constant independent of N. The condition talks about the number of distinct neighbors uh, that the set has. Okay, so I introduce you to the notation n of i or n of j. That's the neighbors of a single vertex. Okay, so when I say n of a subset of vertices, I just mean the union of all of their neighbor sets. Okay, so n of s is everybody that has at least one neighbor in s. Now, if you take a set s, and every node in s has degree d, what is the maximum number of distinct neighbors that you could possibly have. So what's an obvious upper bound on the size of n of s? D n of s? Uh, d times s. Yeah, exactly. Right, so each vertex in s could have the most d neighbors. So this is going to say that it has almost the maximum possible number of distinct neighbors. Okay? So at least, I'm just going to instantiate all the parameters. So let's just say 3 quarters. Anything above 2 thirds would work for all of the arguments today and Wednesday but at least 75% of the maximum possible. Okay? So there's no way it's bigger than d times cardinality of s. It's actually going to be 75% of that maximum amount. And the point here is that this is true not just for some set s, but literally all exponentially many subsets of size up to delta times n. Okay? So not even a single set of size this or less fails to have tons and tons of distinct neighbors. What's the intuition behind why this is a useful property? That's, we'll get to that. So, yeah. A lot of lectures about that explicitly. 
Okay. All right. So one thing I should say is, I mean, this property is so strong. I mean, you should sort of demand that there are examples. Right? So it's, it's really not at all obvious that this is a non-vacuous definition. It's not obvious that any graph satisfies these properties. Okay? So, all right, so, but to people, so everyone's clear on the concept, I hope. So here's your set S, and here's N of S. And N of S should be big, no matter what S is. Okay? So the definition is clear, it's an important definition. All right, so uh, one thing I'll put on homework six is a very classic application of the probabilistic method, which says that these graphs do exist. In fact, if you choose one at random, it's overwhelmingly likely to satisfy this property. Okay, so almost all graphs are expanders in some sense. All right. So with high probability, a random graph that satisfies one and two, so the conditions on the right, also satisfies three, as n grows sufficiently large. Okay, so with high probability means as n goes large, the probability is approaching one, okay? So intuitively, you, I mean, this is, this is roughly the same. Uh, you can think about, like, you just take d random functions. So you take a random function from s to c, and you just superimpose d of those. And this is roughly claiming that what you'll get if you superimpose d random functions, then you'll get this expansion property. Okay? So that, you know, that takes a calculation, it takes a Chernoff bound, then a union bound, some of the stuff that's also in homework five. Um, and so it's a good thing to leave, leave to you. But so that turns out we're not gonna worry about that. Okay? So people do worry a lot about, okay, can you have a de-randomized explicit construction of expanders? That's a hard problem, but if you're happy with a randomized construction, Monte Carlo construction, then just pick one at random and you're done. Okay? So that sort of mirrors what we're talking about with compressive <coughs> sensing too, right? Where we wanted these uh, matrices whose kernels had this almost Euclidean subspace property, and it wasn't at all obvious, but it turned out a random matrix works. Okay? So similar theme here. A random graph gives us the property uh, that we want. All right? Okay, so, so given a graph like this, again, we have a, we get a corresponding LDPC code, and so now I want to develop the idea that these codes are good in various senses, okay? So the first thing I want to prove is that the minimum distance between any two code words is in fact linear in N. In fact, it's lower bounded by the same delta times N in the expansion parameter, okay? So the point is it's growing with n, okay, at the same rate, okay? So distance of such a code is at least delta times n, okay? And again, I mean, in codes, sort of one of the things you're looking for is you're sort of asking, you know, okay, to be resilient to errors, you need redundancy. So always the game is sort of minimize the amount of redundancy, you know, subject to having a certain amount of robustness properties to error. So, you know, this isn't, this isn't optimal in any sense, but this is like a good sanity check, okay? So it says basically as n grows, you're basically still, you know, using a constant fraction of the coordinates for information as opposed to just for redundancy. Okay, that's sort of the point here, all right? Uh, so delta here is sometimes called the rate. Um, good. So why am I doing this? Why am I doing this proposition? Because in some sense, I mean, this is not a computational result, right? So just arguing about the distance just says, in, so this is going to imply in principle, if you have strictly less than delta n over two errors, then by just computing the nearest code word to what you received, that's going to be the intended transmission, right? So that's what we know. So this gives us an information theoretic result. It says we have enough information to figure out what the person sent. But again, the, the sort of the goal, I mean, for the whole class, and particularly for these lectures, is to focus on computationally efficient solutions. But still, you know, this is kind of a, obviously a prerequisite for having a computationally efficient solution, where you have to at least be able to do it in principle, that we will have a polynomial time algorithm. Also, I think this proof starts really showcasing why expansion is a useful property for coding, okay, and in particular for decoding. Right? That's another reason why I want to do the proof, which is, which is not long, okay? <coughs> 
So, right, so remember the code words are exactly those that satisfy all of the parity checks corresponding to the right hand sides. We're going to use that in the proof. <coughs> all right, so proof. So suppose X is a code word, and suppose Z is close in Hamming distance to X. Whoops. So I'm going to write D sub H for the Hamming distance, number of differing coordinates. So what we need to show then is that Z is not a code word. Okay? That's exactly what the proof boils down to. Okay? Show me anything that's not a code word. It can't be too close to anything that is a code word. Sorry, if it's, if it's too close to a code word, it can't itself be a code word. Okay, so consider the dh of xz, consider the Hamming distance number of coordinates in which they differ. Here's the claim. The claim is that there exists a parity check, so a note on the right-hand side. So again, don't ever lose sort of sight of the picture. So V, C, and edges whenever a particular variable participates in a particular parity check. Okay? So there exists a parity check J such that exactly one um, coordinate let's say variable, let's say, yeah, coordinate's fine. Coordinate of S participates in the constraint. So take 30 seconds and convince yourself that if we prove the claim, then we've proved the proposition. So what's the reason? Well, X is a code word. So by definition, it satisfies every single parity check, including parity check J. Okay? Z on the coordinates involved in J differs on exactly one coordinate. Okay? So if X satisfied this parity check and this other thing is off in exactly one coordinate, it's gonna not satisfy the parity check. And that means it's not a code word. Okay? So remember, if you just flip one bit, involved in a parity check, it's going to go from satisfied to unsatisfied or vice versa. So this basically says like from J's local view, right? So think of like a, con think of one of these constraints, these parity checks is just pretending like there's only these, you know, 10 variables in the world, right? And if it sees exactly one of those get flipped, it's going to go from happy to unhappy or vice versa. So this says if uh, they differ in sufficiently few coordinates, there always will exist a parity check which has that property. Okay, so proof of claim then. And this is where we use the expansion property. Well, think about S, right? So S is a subset of the variables of small size. So S corresponds to some region of the left-hand side. Okay? And the size is small enough that the expansion condition holds, is triggered. Okay? So first of all, The total number of edges sticking out of S, well, it's deregular on the left-hand side. So we have the number of vertices times the degree sticking out. On the other hand, by the expansion property, we know that the number of distinct neighbors of S is at least 75% of this number. Okay. So there's something like 100 edges sticking out, okay? They have to be going to at least 75 different nodes. So that leaves only 25 edges left over that could be second edges to any of these nodes, 
Right, these 75 ones to distinct nodes have to be distinct. 25 left over, those could take 25 of those 75 and make them not have a unique neighbor, but that still leaves 50 that have a unique neighbor. Okay? So there's only D over 4 cognitive of S edges left over after accounting for all the distinct neighbors. So in fact, there's not just one parity check that has a unique neighbor, there's tons of them. Okay? So at least 3 quarters minus 1 quarter times ds nodes of n of s have a unique neighbor in s. Okay? Any questions about that? So that's where the claim's true, and then the claim implies the proposition. So intuitively, this expander property is sort of saying, you know, you have kind of maximal disjointness between what the different parity checks are doing, subject to the fact that, you know, there's enough of them that they have to overlap to some degree. Okay? So agreed? Okay. So they've got big distance, at least. There remains the question of how can we actually do this decoding efficiently. So any questions before we get to the linear programming relaxation and some discussion of when it might be exact? Everything clear? Okay. All right, so uh, the same way we did with, say, the cut problems a few lectures ago, let's start with an integer programming formulation. This is already actually sort of interesting. And then the linear programming for formulation will be sort of obvious, given the integer programming formulation. Okay, so... IP formulation. So intuitively, right, so we're given, uh, we're given some received vector Z. Okay, so given Z, which like everything else is a binary end vector. Okay? This is, we're assuming this is sort of not a code word. It was obtained from a code word that got flipped in some small number of coordinates, less than delta n. And we want to know what is that code word, okay? So, so very rough, I mean, so just very high level, this is the optimization problem we want to solve, okay? So we're given z, we want to solve for x, with minimizing the Hamming distance, and what are the feasible solutions? The feasible solutions are just the code words x, okay? So this is kind of in English what we want. So let me show you how we take this and how we turn it into an integer program, okay? So there's going to be these variables x where the semantics are very clear. So this is literally just the coordinates of the code word that we're computing, okay? There's going to be xi's that we're solving for. Now I have to tell you how do we express the objective and uh, how do we express these constraints, okay? The objective is easy, actually. So let's some notation. So let's say, um, so let's let i be the coordinates. It's a different color. Right? So let's say um, i is the coordinates on which zi is zero. Okay. So we're given z, this corrupted code word. It's zero on I, capital I, it's gonna be one on capital J. Okay, so capital J is just gonna be the complement of capital I. And so then the objective, Hamming distance, we can just say wherever Z was zero, we would also like to be zero. If we're not zero, 
then we pay a penalty. Okay? If it's a one, we pay a penalty. And wherever the received code word was a one, we would also like to be a one. Okay, we're trying to minimize Hamming distance. Okay? And we're going to pay a penalty if we're not a one. Okay? So that's our objective. Now, let me see, it's going to be convenient to simplify this. So, namely, I'm just going to delete these ones. Okay? If you think about it, for every single code word, every single feasible solution, these ones contribute exactly cardinality of j to the objective function. Doesn't matter which code word it is. Okay? So if I just drop that cardinality of j, the relative ordering of the solutions is still the same, so the optimum is still the same. Okay? So actually, the objective function that we're going to use is uh, minimize over the zero coordinates xi minus over the one coordinates xi. Okay? That's the final objective. All right? All right, so how do we encode x being a code word? Okay? So constraints, this is a nice idea, actually. So let me tell you the intuition. So, so first of all, by definition, x is a code word if and only if it satisfies every parity check. Okay? And so we want to kind of imagine, again, we sort of want to put ourselves in the place of one of these parity checks, which is only staring at like 10 variables. Okay? So a given parity check, j, basically doesn't care about any of the other variables. It's just paying attention to these 10. Okay? Some variables to these 10 assi some assignments to these 10 variables will make it happy, some won't. So we're going to have one constraint per, uh, per um, uh, parity check saying that locally, this constraint's local view makes it happy. But then we're also going to have constraints which say the local views of different parity checks should be consistent with some overall assignment. Okay? So, for a given parity check J, let AJ be the sort of local assignments, if you will, that make it happy. Okay? So this is going to be like a 10 vector. Okay, so n of j are the variables that participate in the parity check corresponding to j. So this is just one uh, assignment, Boolean assignment, to each variable participating in this constraint. And it's happy whenever there's an even number of ones. So parity of y is even. All right. So again, this is just like imagine parity check j staring only at the variables it cares about. These are all the things that make it happy. Okay? And the way we're going to encode this in the integer program is uh, we're going to have y, j, comma, a. All right, so we have a decision variable for every parity check and for every possible kind of local assignment of its variables that makes it happy with the interpretation that yja is 1 if <coughs> in the code word we're computing its value on the coordinates that this uh, parity check j cares about is equal to a and 0 otherwise. Okay. Now, we've seen things like this before. So just in case you're getting lost in the notation, I mean, we've seen stuff like this before, just with a little less notation. So for example, what we were do in our linear programming relaxation of multi-way cut, very, very similar. Okay, so in multi-way cut, we had k terminals, and each vertex was being assigned to exactly one of those k terminals. Okay, so we had these variables, which were like y of v comma i. v gets assigned to i. And then we summed them and said they should equal to 1. Okay? Here, you know, it's basically the same thing. We're basically saying, look, there's a given parity check. It has to, its variables have to be assigned to something, and they have to be assigned to something with even parity if this is going to be a code word. And we're just saying, let's enumerate. So rather than enumerating each of the k groups that a vertex could get assigned to in a multi-way cut, we're enumerating the different possible even parity uh, assignments that, that one could make to the parity check j's set of variables. Okay? So it's exactly the same. 
And so the, sec the first set of constraints, which references these variables, are for every parity check. And again, this is exactly what we had in multi-way cut. So instead of summing over the vertex groups, we're just summing over the satisfying assignments. And overall, this should sum to one. Okay. So any questions about that? So this says, parity check J, you better make it happy by picking some little a in capital A sub J. Okay, that's what we're saying. Haven't we just created a huge number of variables? Good. There's one for each possibility? It's a good comment. So let's think about how big is AJ, okay? Sort of depends on how big N of J is, right? So you know, it, so J is a parity check. There's some number of variables in it. If there's like five variables in it, okay, then there's 32 assignments in all. Half of them have even parity. Okay, so A of J would have size 16 if there were five nodes adjacent to it. Okay? In general, it's going to be exponential in the number of neighbors. Right? So this motivates the low density part of low density parity check codes. So remember, conditions one and two said this should be bounded degree, should be constant degree, 10, 20, something like that. Okay? It's not sensible to write down this linear program if you have a really large uh, number of variables in a, in a parity check. Okay. But as long as the parity checks are sparse, this is this is this is legit. Okay. Okay. Legit at least in the sense of being polynomial size. Okay. And polynomial time solvable. Okay. So this is not good enough. Okay. So without further constraints, there can be feasible solutions meaning assignments to x and y, integer solutions to x and y, so that it is not a code word. Do you see why? So notice there is, there is nowhere in this integer program does, do x and y appear in the same line, okay? So there is currently no coupling between the x values and the y values, all right? I mean, there are in terms of the semantics, right? I mean, so what we're thinking Y corresponds to is this, all right? But Y is really just some binary variable that the integer program can do whatever it wants with, okay? And the only constraints that we have right now are these. So without further constraints, what the integer program can do is it can set the X's to whatever it wants, <coughs> okay? And if you look at it, uh, if you look at the... Zero. Well, so it's gonna depend on uh, Z. Set to Z. Right, yeah, so you're gonna set it to Z. Exactly, right? So you're just going to set it to Z. That <coughs> obviously minimizes Hamming distance with respect to the thing you got Z. And you, the, the complaint should be, oh, but Z's not a code word. I thought that was the point. It's like, well, yeah, but the only way you're trying to enforce it being a code word is through the Y's. And for the Y's, I'll just have each parity check independently pick its favorite satisfying assignment to its own coordinates, okay? Now these parity checks overlap, so you should complain that like if variable number 17 appears in these two different parity checks, it should have this same value in both of those parity checks, but that's not up on the board anywhere, okay? So that's why we're not done. We need sort of consistency constraints, which link X and Y, and in particular say that, you know, whatever one parity check thinks XI is, other parity checks should think the same value. So here's how we do that. So for every edge of the graph, so again here I is a variable, J is a parity check in which that variable participates. This is how we're gonna write it. We sum, okay, so we, ha we have some fixed parity check J. We think about all the local assignments we might conceivably use to satisfy parity check J, that's capital A sub J, and then we focus only on the ones where X is set to one. So let me use the notation A of I, oops, should be A. A of I equal to one. Okay, so that means in this particular assignment, xi is set to 1. And then here I'm just going to write y, j, a. Okay. Now think about this constraint in terms of the intended semantics. Okay. So in the intended semantics, you have these y, j, a's, and all of them are 0, except for one value of a, for which y, j, a is equal to 1. Okay, and that corresponds to the assignment of these variables. Either xi is set to 0, in this local assignment, or it's set to one, okay? 
And so what we're doing is we're summing only over the subset of satisfying assignments where xi is set to 1. And so if one of those is in fact the one used, that will contribute 1 to the right hand side. If actually we're using one of the other ones, the sum is just going to be empty. It's going to be a bunch of zeros, and so xi will be 0. Okay? So it actually does what you want. So summarizing, I claim at least that if you take any code word and you think about the induced values of the xi's and the y's according to these semantics, you certainly get a feasible solution. But now also the converse is true with, now that we've added the constraints three. Okay? The only way to satisfy these constraints is in fact, well first of all, the constraints two insist that every parity check is sort of locally satisfied. And constraints three says actually there's some you know, consistent assignment to x1 through xn that induces the y's through this relationship. Okay? So the only way you can satisfy 2 and 3 is by setting x to be a code word and y's to respect this, this relationship. Okay? So any questions about that? Okay. So, uh, let's summarize. So we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between code words of our uh, LDPC and integer, zero, one integer solutions to this integer program. The optimal solution, you know, because of the, our discussion with the objective function, the optimal solution of this integer program is exactly the nearest code word to Z. Okay? So solving this integer program really does solve the nearest code word problem. Okay? Now that's an NP-hard problem in general. Uh, so recurring theme, right? So just like how multi-way cut without stability constraints, it's NP hard. You know, underdetermined linear systems without some assumptions, it's NP hard. Uh, so we're going to look at the linear relaxation, and then we're going to ask when does it? What are conditions under which it's exact? Yeah. Uh, we need to put x i in zero one too, right? Uh, yes, that's the very first thing I did. Oh. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I went from sort of. Easiest to understand, hopefully the hardest to understand. So I thought, I thought that was a good place to start. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So the uh, so the LP relaxation then is the one you'd think, given everything so far. So minimize that objective function subject to the local consistency. So the local uh, sort of satisfaction constraints, the feasibility constraints, or sorry, the consistency constraints. But instead of the 0, 1, you just have non-negativity constraints. Okay, so this we're going to call LP. All right. And if there's only a constant number of variables in each parity check constraints, then we can solve this linear program in polynomial time. Okay, with a caveat that indeed the number of constraints uh, or even the number of variables, the number of y's, is exponential in the number of variables appearing in a parity check. Okay. <coughs> All right. So here's the theorem, which we'll kind of prove half of for the rest of this lecture. And then I think we'll only need about 30 minutes max on Wednesday to finish, <laughs> to finish, to finish it up. Uh, so there's sort of a sequence of papers about LP decoding in various codes. The result I'm going to discuss is from 07, Feldman, Malkin, uh, Servetio, I forget the second S, Wainwright, Stein, Stein, Wainwright. Um, and so basically, so remember we, we had this sort of preliminary litmus test, well can we at least recover in principle? And we said, yeah, as long as it's a graph that satisfies those three properties, then we can do it. Now it's gonna be basically the same statement, but we can do it in polynomial time. Okay, so one of the constants will get a little bit less, but otherwise it's exactly the same statement, but now constructive. Not only can we do it in polynomial time, but in fact we'll do it just by solving this LP, okay? So if the graph G satisfies one through three, so this just said D regular on the left, bounded degree on the right in that expansion condition. Um, and Z So the received the received transmission suffered at most delta not, delta not n errors. 
Okay, so our expansion condition, so the information theoretic result just had delta times n, now it's going to be delta naught n, where delta naught is a constant smaller than delta, somewhat, but still independent of n, so it's still a constant fraction. Uh, LP is exact. Okay. So that's the, that's the main result of this LP decoding stuff that I'm going to cover. Okay. There's a lot of other results of this flavor, but this, this is a, a nice, relatively famous and representative result. So is that all clear? Yeah. Okay. Good. So here's how I'm going to split up. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the proof modular in a similar way I've done for many of these other recovery results. Namely, I'm going to first, we're first just going to study what are some sufficient conditions under which the algorithm would work. Uh, and then we're going to connect our assumptions about the input here on the graph G to those sufficient conditions. Okay, I'm going to do that first part today, I'm going to do the second part tomorrow. So today I want to introduce a technique, a new technique, which I alluded to last lecture, but you haven't really seen, about how you'd go about proving a result like this. How would you ever establish that some linear program, which in general is not integer, how would you ever uh, prove that under some extra condition it is guaranteed to be integral? Okay. Something just as a sanity check, notice if we solve this thing and we get back an integer solution, all the x's and y's are 0, 1, then we're definitely optimal. We're not worried about that, right? Because remember, every, you know, the, the integer solutions correspond exactly to the nearest code words. Okay? So if we optimize over everything, we get an integer solution, in particular it's the best integer solution, so it has to be the nearest code word. All right? the, report, the worry, and this will happen in general because it's empty hard, the worry is that we get something fractional. Fractional x's, fractional y's, and it doesn't correspond to a code word at all. Okay? So it's not really about proving optimality, it's just about proving integrality. Okay? That's really what the theorem's about. Okay. okay. So, good. So let me just, a preliminary observation, uh, which I'll put on the homework, although the argument's simple. Which is that if we, if we want to prove this theorem, as I've stated it here, actually it's good enough to prove it in the special case where the nearest code word to Z is the all zeros code word. Okay? Notice, for any, any code like this, the all zeros will be a code word. Okay, you definitely satisfy every parity check you could ever write down if you're all zeros. And the claim is just that by symmetry, if the LP is always integral, when the nearest code word is all zeros, then it's always integral no matter what the actual nearest code word is. Okay? And that's a simple shifting slash translation argument. Okay? So I'll let you think that through offline. So this will just this will save me some notation in the class. So enough. So the general case reduces to the special case uh, where the nearest code word to Z is zero. So that means what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that the best solution to this linear program is just to set xi equal to zero for every single i. Okay? Given that the nearest code word is actually all xi is equal to zero, we're just trying to prove the linear program will solve to that. Notice that if all the xi is equal to zero, then the objective function value of LP is also equal to zero. Okay? <coughs> So we're basically trying to prove that there do not exist feasible solutions to the linear program that have negative objective function value. Which of course is not obvious because we have those minus terms on the uh, coordinates in J. Okay? All right. So let's just focus on the case where the nearest code word is all zeros and we're really hoping that this solves to that solution, and ask when would that happen? So sufficient conditions for success. Right. And the idea is an important one. The idea is, would be called a dual certificate. Okay, 
So basically what the argument is going to be using is LP duality. But uh, if you haven't really studied linear programming or duality, don't worry for two reasons. First of all, we're only going to use the easy direction of LP duality, not the hard direction. And secondly, even that, you don't need to know what it is because I'm just going to give you a self-contained proof. Okay? But for those of you who know duality, you know, try to spot how this is just a special case of weak, LP, weak linear programming duality. Okay? I mentioned this in passing last lecture when we were talking about semi-random and planted models. Ooh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, tch, tch, tch. Yeah, it's okay. Um, because we talked about how for planted models, relatively simple algorithms can work, but if you have a semi-random adversary, the only, one of the only known ways to get recovery results is through using semi-definite programming. And then we wrote down a semi-definite program, and we argued that it was a relaxation, and then we didn't prove that it was exact. I just stated that it was exact, and I said that the way that that's proved is by guessing and checking a suitable dual. Okay? And what we're going to do now is exactly that. Happily, it's for linear programs, so it's going to be an easier argument. We can just finish it in the rest of the lecture. Okay? So this is really an example of the same kind of argument used uh, to establish those semi-random model recovery results. Okay. So here's the definition, uh, and this is going to be the nature of the certificate. Okay, so the kind of result we're going to get is going to say, it's going to be you know, a little abstract. I mean, we'll do some examples to get a feel for it. But the high level picture will be, we'll say, if, you know, a certain, if a certain set of weights on the edges of this graph exists, then it'll be a sufficient condition for this linear program to solve uh, to the integer solution that we want. Okay, so we're going to reduce exact solutions or an integral solution to this to a more combinatorial kind of existence statement. All right. So keep in mind this bipartite graph that we've got. Vertices over here, parity checks over here, variables, constraints. So what we're going to be looking for is we're going to be looking for an assignment of weights to the, these edges. Okay? And the weights might be positive, they might be negative. Okay? We're allowed to use both. And, and, again, and we want weights with certain properties, because okay? these are going to guarantee the success of our algorithm. So edge weights, W, for this graph G, are called feasible if they meet three conditions. Okay? And they're all simple enough. So let's remember what capital I is. Right? So we received this corrupted code word Z. Okay? I is the coordinates where Z is zero. Given that the ground truth is zero, these are exactly the coordinates where there was no bit flip. These are the uncorrupted coordinates. The other ones are J. Those are the ones. Those are also the corrupted coordinates. Okay? So we're thinking of I as being like 99% of the coordinates and J as being like 1% of the coordinates, okay? So for anything which is not corrupted, it should be the case, so remember this, so this is a variable, so I would correspond to like something here. The weight should satisfy the property that if I scan all the incident edges, the sum of the weights should be less than one, okay? So if I sum over all of the neighbors of I, Wij, that's the most one. Okay? That's the first condition. So that's for uncorrupted coordinates, or coordinates of Z which have a zero in them. For coordinates of Z that have a one, exactly the same thing, except this one becomes a negative one. Okay? So this is actually going to force some of the weights to be negative, if you think about it. Okay? So some of the weights incident to a corrupted, to a one, has to be at most minus one. So let me just put this, no, I shouldn't do that. So 2, i, and j, um, sum of the w, i, j at most minus 1, j and n of i, okay? Now if that's all there was, no big deal, right? Just set all the weights to like negative infinity, we're fine, okay? So the third one is sort of pushed back in the other direction. 
And so for the third one, we think about, we think about things from the perspective of a parity check J. And we're going to look at a pair of variables, I and I prime, that participate in this parity check. Okay, so that's two edges. And we insist that the to their total weight is non-negative. Okay, so one of them is allowed to be negative, but when I take the sum of a pair, it should be non-negative. Right. So if we have J and C, and I, I prime, in uh, the corresponding constraint, so i.e. neighbors of J, then it should be the case that uh, Wij plus Wi prime J is non-negative. Okay? So just to, get a, uh, to start getting a little, so what I'm going to prove to you in a second is that whenever you have feasible edge weights, the linear program solves to integers, okay? So in other words, it, what this definition accomplishes is it reduces what we really care about, proving exactness of linear program to proving existence of one of these things, okay? Now up front, that's not, it's not clear why that's useful because it's not clear it's so easy to verify these things, okay? But at least to sort of start giving you a little bit of a feeling for it, like, let's think about the case where there were sort of like very few errors, okay? So intuitively, right, we sort of know what's going to happen, right? We know that basically, you know, if I just give you as input, you know, z equals zero, then the LP is going to be fine, right? It's not going to do anything else. It's going to give you back, you know, x equals zero. And we're sort of thinking that, you know, okay, if only a few things are flipped, probably the linear program is going to still be fine. But then eventually, once we corrupt enough, the linear program will give us back fractional answers or something like that. But I, it's actually, if you think about the linear program and proving exactness, it's kind of like, how is that going to play out? Right? So how, like, where is this phase transition where it goes from being exact to non-exact? And how would you have a proof that kind of looks like that? Whereas, as far, you know, now that we've reformulated as far as the existence of feasible edge weights, you can sort of get some feel for like why, you know, as so, there'll be some low level of errors where you can prove these exist, and then there'll be some high level of errors where you can't prove these exist. Okay, so it seems a little, just a little, you know, a little bit more... Uh, something you can get your hands on. <coughs> For example, suppose every vertex, every coordinate was in capital I. Okay? So that would be like no errors at all, which is stupid, but let's just think about this definition. Okay? If you have no errors at all, then you have a budget of one on every single node on the left for your weights. And all you got to do is make sure all these pairs are non-negative. So if everything is an I, an obvious feasible solution is set tau equals zero. Sorry, set w equals zero everywhere, right? So that, that's just a quick sanity check. But intuitively, it's sort of like, okay, but if there's very few errors, this should basically still work, almost, okay? So like, here's a, maybe a little bit more intuition. So suppose everybody on the left has exactly degree 10, say, okay? And let's say just there's a few people who got corrupted, okay? So there's a few vertices, a few variables in capital J, okay? So now it's sort of annoying because there's a few vertices where you actually, the sum of their weights has to be minus one, basically, right? That's what two says, right? This is really annoying, okay? So you're like, okay, well maybe I'll just like split that minus one equally among my 10 incident edges, like minus 0.1 on each of them, okay? And then for the guys in I, I'll just have them be like 0.1 everywhere or something, okay? And that's actually gonna work if you have few enough errors, okay? So if you think about it, when is that going to go wrong? All right, so here you have, so let's just focus on two of the villains, which have been corrupted, I and I prime, okay? So these are both in J, capital J. So here we need, the sum of the weights has to be below minus one, okay? So we're, we're thinking about just having like minus one over D. You know, so minus 0.1 on each of these. Okay? So imagine we just take every single coordinate that's a one and we put minus one over D on all the incident edges. What could go wrong? If they collide on one, one of the Exactly right, exactly right. So what could go wrong is if we have two corrupted coordinates that show up in a common parity check. Why is that a problem? Well, let's look at condition three, 
Condition three says that for every parity check constraint and every pair of vertices participating, the sum of their values, of their weights, has to be non-negative. Right? So if you have two that collide, then each one's contributing minus one over D, and that's negative. So that's, that's not okay. On the other hand, conversely, if the errors are so sparse, you only get one error per parity check, this works, actually, which is nice. So it just feels a lot less brittle. I mean, you can kind of feel, you know, how maybe, you know, you know, we can imagine a little bit more having a proof that argues about when these things exist and when they don't. Okay? Now, to prove that these exist as far as we want, uh, we're going to have to have basically a more clever version of this argument, okay? a more adaptive version of this argument. And that'll be, that'll be Wednesday. Okay? So that's all to develop your intuition a little bit for you know, what these things look like, what's the nature of the constraints, you know, why, you know, how we're going to use them on Wednesday. But the last thing I owe you is I owe you a proof that whenever these exist, in fact, the LP is exact. Okay? So is everyone clear on all that? Okay. All right. And so this, um, I'm going to be honest with you, this is a little tedious. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm going to do it anyways, just because it seemed unfair to put it on homework. And it also seemed so crucial for the argument, I didn't feel, feel comfortable skipping it. Okay? So, but just going to warn you. Um, and again, for those of you that know LP duality, you'll recognize this is, uh, as an instantiation of it. Unfortunately, not the, not the clearest instantiation of it. But. Okay, so here's, the, here's lemma one. Lemma two will be Wednesday. If there exists feasible weights, then um, x equals 0 is the unique op solution for the linear program. Okay? That's exactly what we want. So we solve the linear program, and out pops the nearest code word on a silver platter. Okay? All right. So we talked about how the objective function value, right, of this target solution x equals zero, the objective function value is zero. Okay? And right, if all the x's are zero, the objective function, remember it's just the sum of the xi's on i minus some of the xi's on j. So what we're going to prove, we need to prove that basically anything else has strictly positive objective function value. Okay? So let w be feasible weights, and xy be feasible for the linear program. Okay? So W satisfies this stuff, one, two, three, and XY satisfies constraints paren two and paren three. Okay? And we have to use most of those properties in the proof. Okay. So first of all, right, so we want to prove that this feasible linear programming solution, it always has non-negative objective function value, and its objective function value equals zero if and only if x is the all-zero solution. Right? That's what I want to prove. So let's look at the objective function value of this feasible solution. All right, so sum over the xi's for the zero coordinates minus the sum over the xi's in the one coordinates. This is going to be challenging. Okay, yeah, so I guess, well, this is good. So I'm going to use properties one and two right now. Okay. So some of the weights around a zero coordinate is strictly less than one. Some of the weights around a one coordinate is strictly less than minus one. So I'm going to just, you know, imagine, right? So there's, if I like, there's a coefficient of one right there. And I can think of this as being a coefficient of minus one. Okay. So by substituting in the sum of the weights, I get something that's only less. Okay? So this is the objective function value of a feasible solution. I claim it's lower bounded by this. Okay? So I just stick in the sum of the weights incident to the variable i, 
So this is by conditions one and two of feasible weights. I'm also using the fact that x is non-negative. Okay. Everyone cool with that? Moreover, if you, the conditions I just erased were strict. Weights are strictly less than one, strictly less than minus one. So this holds as a strict inequality, except in the special case where every x is zero. Okay? If at least one of these xi's is strictly positive, I get a strict inequality. Okay? So what I've done is I've reduced lemma one to proving that this stuff in white is non-negative. Right? That's the rest of the proof. If this stuff is non-negative, that says everything is strictly positive except for the one case where x is always zero, which has objective function value zero. That means x equals zero is the unique optimal solution. Okay. All right. So. Serious real estate problems. All right, so we need to prove this is non-negative, right? So goal non-negative. All right, so what's next? So let's rewrite this a little bit. So what are we doing here, right? So okay, so let's. Uh, this is just over the zero coordinates. This is over the one coordinates. Let's just combine these two, right? The inner, what the expression and the sum is the same either way. So think of this as just the sum over all of the left-hand side nodes. So what are we doing? We're summing over the left-hand side nodes one by one. When we get to a left-hand side node i, we just sum over its neighbors. Okay? So in other words, we're counting every edge of this graph exactly once. Okay? So let's just be a little more explicit about that. So this is equal to the sum over the edges of wij xi. Okay? So the Circled quantity in orange is exactly this. So you sum over all the edge weights, except when you get to a given edge, you multiply it by the x value uh, that, uh, of the feasible solution of that particular variable. All right? Now, I'm going to use these. I'm going to use these constraints. Okay, so I'm going to expand the xi's in terms of the y's. So basically, in these derivations, there these, there's these types of math where basically, you know, the first time you see it, you're like, how would anyone come up with a proof like this? But then it's kind of like, at some point you realize it's like it's one of those proofs where there's only one, like, applicable step at every step. So you literally just follow your nose and it just, like, writes itself. And then you have this page of math, but it's like a correct proof. And somehow it goes from being, in, you know, kind of... Um, inscrutable to being almost trivial. Right? So that was, that's what happens here. It's like we start with the objective function value. We say, does either one of our constraints apply either for the weights or for the linear program? And then if not, then you reverse a double sum. I'm not kidding. That's the algorithm. With that algorithm, reverse a double sum or apply a constraint, you can do every weak duality proof you'll ever see. Okay? <laughs> so what I did here is I applied the only sort of applicable uh, constraint which is we had the x's and want to go the y's. I don't know how to interpret that, but there's a lot of sums there, so I'm going to reverse them. Okay? <laughs> it's true. You can be algorithmic in your proofs as well. So, All right, so what is this doing? So we go through each edge. So let's think about this. What is this thing doing? Right, so this sums over each edge one at a time, and then when it gets to an edge, it looks at the constraint and... Uh, it basically looks at all of the potential assignments, satisfying assignments to this constraint in which this variable is equal to one. So reversing the sum says, actually, let's instead go over the assignments one by one. Right? So rather than going over the assignments of AJ last, let's go over the assignments of AJ first, and then sum over the variables in that assignment that are set to one. 
That's what the sum reversal means. So the dust settles, and uh, what do you get? This is what you get. I can erase this. I've used this. Bye bye. All right. So equals. <coughs> Let's sum over the constraints first, then I want to sum over the satisfying assignments for the variables participating in the jth constraint. The y values only depend on the constraint and the assignment, so I can put those first. And now I'm going I'm to sum over the variables set to 1 in a given assignment. Okay? So i for which a of i sets it to 1. Cool. So let's look at, so let's, okay, so now what? Now what? Now what? Well, the only thing we haven't used basically is condition three of the feasibility constraint for weights. So that has to sort of be the key. But let's think about some special cases. So don't forget what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove this thing's non-negative, always. Right? That was the very first step. If we can prove this non-negative always, we're done. So let's just think about a few A's, okay? So Assignments, locally satisfying assignments to the jth parity check has an even number of ones. Could be zero, could be two, could be four, could be six, whatever. Okay? So what if like nothing in A is set to one? What is this final sum? What is this thing? Zero. It's just an empty sum. So that's good. We want to prove this thing's not negative, right? What if the assignment A sets exactly <coughs> two variables to one? Boom. Condition three. It's not negative. Uh, oh, but what if it sets four to one? It's fine. Break four into two pairs of two arbitrarily. That applies to each pair of two. As a sum of non-negative things. So it's still not negative. Okay? And that's true no matter what even number it is. Okay? So that's what finally happens, is the double sum sort of isolates, you know, this part of the quantity so that, you know, Inner sum value by inner sum value, the, sorry, outer sum index by outer sum index, the inner sum is non-negative. Okay? So we're using the non-negativity of the y's here as well. All right. So that's lemma one. Lemma two is going to say that as long as j is not too big, remember j are the coordinates in which there are ones, i.e. j are the coordinates in which there's been corruptions, because we're assuming that the nearest code word is zero, i.e., you know, j is the coordinate where the sum of the weights have to be at less than minus one. Okay, so the pesky uh, variables where the sum of the weights has to be small. As long as there's at most delta naught times n of those, then uh, we're going to show a constructive proof for how to come up with these feasible weights. Okay? And the argument actually isn't that different than the naive thing we tried to do first, where we just set it to be minus one over d everywhere. We're basically going to do like a mildly, well, somewhat more clever version of that, where we also make use of the expansion properties of G, which we know is important. So any questions? Then to be continued on Wednesday. See you then.